Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Kyle Miller Show. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, I'm on a mission to bring you stories, insights from extraordinary individuals who are doing great things with their lives, right? People who have transformed their life, other people's lives, trying to transform more people's lives, right? I'm happy to have you on the podcast today. Not only do I want to show you people that have transformed their lives, I want to be here to inspire you to transform your own, to take the changes that you need to do, to make, do the work that you need to do, uh, to chase your dreams, and really go out there and succeed. So with that, today I have Noah. Um, Noah's on the show. Um, thank you for jumping on, coming, coming here and speaking with me. Um, it's going to be an exciting show because... I really like what you're doing. I like what you have going on in your life and what you're trying to do, right? I think you're, you're one of the only people that I've talked to that could really, what your invention is, what you're doing could affect way more people's lives than, than, than I could ever imagine, right? Um, and so Noah, thank you for jumping on the show. He, Noah Healy, thank you for jumping on the show. I really appreciate it. And, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, thanks for having me on, Kyle. Um, so I'm a, I'm a Charlottesville native, uh, born and raised here, and I went to UVA, got out at around the year 2000, and started working for mostly dot-com startups and tech, uh, and started learning about computer science in a, in a really rigorous way, and absolutely fell in love with computational mathematics. Uh, which has become sort of my primary ho hobby for the last quarter of a century. So computational mathematics. Explain, like, what is that? It's a... So you're familiar with arithmetic from elementary school, plus and times and so on. Right. Computational mathematics would be mathematics of how to carry out those computations. So in elementary school, they basically teach you some basic tables. Mm -hmm. You just memorize that three and four is seven, for example. Right. But that's not the only way to make three and four equal seven. Um, the computer does it in binary. It only knows what one and one or one and zero or zero and one or zero and zero add up to. Um, and it uses this thing called a half adder to put that together. Mm -hmm. So uh, the set of processes by which you can carry out those computations is the providence of computational mathematics okay so still i i get it <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of ones and zeros but there's a lot of mathematical ways to get to to answers well the the important thing about that is that there are efficient ways to get to these mathematical answers and that's that's like the basis of your your whole invention of what you're doing is just becoming more efficient right with mathematics and with everything that we have, go, all the tools that we have, our main objective is to get more efficient, is it not? Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big one, yes. Uh, that there's, there's kind of two different things you can sort of seek to do. There's accomplishing the things that you already accomplish, but with less effort. Mm -hmm. And there's exerting new effort to accomplish new things that could never happen before. Gotcha. So... Y you're a mathematician, but you're also an inventor, and, and I, I think it's pretty neat, and I'd love to hear a little bit more what you've kind of invented. Guys, he has, he's working on patent pending in the U.S. Patent Office right now, and he's going to get in and tell you a little bit about what's going on there, but it's very interesting um, how everything is kind of playing out and, and what's going on. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how, it's, uh, how it will affect the marketplace and people's lives, and you know why haven't why hasn't it moved yet? Why hasn't it gone past where we're where you're currently at? <laughs> well, so what I have is a new way of determining prices, mm -hmm. uh, and this is tricky because prices are ultimately a human decision. So. We can't, we can't scan our brains and sort of figure out what that answer is. We need human inputs to come in, but then we need to process those inputs in various ways that tells us what our own opinions are because it's not just about you. It's about what everybody else also thinks at the same time. So 
I've found a way to separate the negotiation interest in price from the transfer of goods, the actual trading interest in price. Okay. And so instead of the traditional two-sided marketplace of buyers and sellers, I have a three-sided marketplace of producers, consumers, and negotiators, and people can put on as many hats as they feel like and play in as many of those marketplaces as is profitable for them. Do you feel... I'll get into that question in a second. It's coming, though. Um, so tell us what's going on. Like, how, how is it going to impact? So we see that it has, you know, you, you, your three sides. Right. Right? How is it going to impact? How is it increase people's lives? How does sure. it make it better? Uh, well, so the existing markets probably cost uh, the U.S. economy somewhere in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars a year right now. Okay. Um, and when you say cost, you're talking about transaction fees? What are you, what are you specifically referring mostly to? Mostly it's opportunity costs. Opportunity costs. Okay. So when you buy something at the store, let's say you're buying something relatively unprocessed like fruit or, or like flour, which is a little processed. Um, you're paying whoever made that some amount of money. Their, their primary costs are their, their goods. You right. know, the, the packaging company that's putting those apples in the bag needs to buy those apples. Right. The bag's not the, not the expensive part. The transport's not the expensive part. The apples are the expensive part. The flour, same deal. The grinding isn't free, but it's the wheat that really is going to cost you. Right. And so they pay for that. But they don't pay, in general, farmers when there's an inter, uh, interim marketplace. They pay whoever's on the other side of the contract that they get. And that person is 98, 97% of the time uh, some professional trader okay. who 98, 97% of the time bought it from another professional trader. And on average, there's about... 40 to 50 middlemen until you get to the farmer. And since those people aren't working for free, that's where the trillion dollars comes from. Gotcha. So trillion dollars is going to the middlemen. Basically, yes. Where, where it could be to help people's lives, help the farmers on this example, that money could... Now, granted, there has to be some people in the middle transporting and making things happen. Well, wholesalers. The, that, that negotiation interest, which I have a dedicated marketplace for, is a legitimate and important function. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I have a dedicated marketplace for it that does just that function and not just allow people to come up with new ways to wedge themselves in. So before the advent of computerization, the number of middlemen in the market was eight to 10. Mm -hmm. So the no over the last quarter century, the amount of produce that we can get out of an acre of land has gone up by, on average, around a factor of 10. Okay. And the number of middlemen have gone up by, on average, a factor of five. Okay. So the farmers are radically more productive, but they're not radically more profitable because the, their profit opportunities have been eaten up by more middlemen producing the old, the old level of service. There's too many hands in the pot. Exactly. Is what it is. And, and with, with the invention of the computer and the technology, there comes more ways to figure out how to get their hand in the pot. Precisely, yes. Because they're trying to figure out what the marketplace will pay. What can I negotiate the farmer down to? And, what, and they're basically making zero money. They're, they're just able to cover costs, right? And then in the middle, that's where all the profit's made. Right. And so you want to eliminate that. Uh, I want to manage it in a way that benefits everybody. Gotcha. And, and so tell, like, how does that, how does that, you know, how did you come about that? How did you create this? What are the things you had to do? Well, I mentioned before that computational mathematics is my hobby. Right. Um, like, so, so you read math books for fun. Sure. Yeah. Okay. The big ones. I've got shelves. <laughs> um, nice. You saw some on yeah. the on on the call. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of it's online, so okay. I've read you know the internet. Uh, the but 
I was I was kind of looking down the barrel of of a sort of self created sabbatical and and seeing things like uh, the Internet of Things, um, work being done with AI, uh, and also vast increases in computer storage, so lots more logging and other things like that going on. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about the problem of consensus. So how do you, how do you know what you know? Uh, I'd been with several companies that had failed because management made decisions that files on program on computers that the company owned mm -hmm. and had free access to said that those decisions were bad, and then those decisions were implemented, and they turned out to be bad, and the company either collapsed or stalled out or had some other basically fatal outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was curious, you know, we, we're evolved to kind of see what we see, taste what we taste, touch what we touch, but we're now expanding the array of information that's coming in without changing how we can process that. And processing information, again, that's a computational mathematical problem. Right. And so I was like, well, this seems like something that would be both valuable and interesting and i'm gonna i'm gonna see what i can do right and so uh i was playing around with uh ideas around prediction markets and betting markets and i came up with this game theory model for how to generate new kinds of prediction and betting markets right and then I had this sort of inspiration after talking to a friend of mine about what I'd done, uh, that if I could turn this system in on itself, it could actually become a marketplace. And I'd been to you know Econ 201, 202 over at UVA. I knew that markets were known to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to use my technique to create a marketplace on the lines and scale of existing financial markets, basically with the expectation that if this could get close, like, like since these things are known to be perfect, if I could come up with something that was close or good or, or you know, something like that, right. that would be a vast validation of this particular approach. And, and so... So what actually happened is it turned out that it's hundreds of thousands of times better because I mean, the that's... belief that they're perfect is based on a misapprehension that deal information cannot be separated from deal execution. But in the computer world, we can do all kinds of things with information. So, so that's, I mean, when you get into that, it gets, it gets a little hairy, right, in regards to like how much stuff is going on and just all of it involved, right? How do you how do you separate yourself? Like, how do you separate you know this market and put it all together? That's that's to me that would be daunting. It, like, there's so many mathematical equations that's probably going into that. I spent several months sort of lost in my head mm -hmm. um, with a few dark nights of the soul, uh, sort of worried about whether or not I was I was even possibly doing anything, but. Eventually, um, I worked out sort of some basic properties that would be necessary mm -hmm. uh, and, and worked out the proofs for that. And then I found functions that had the properties necessary. And then I plugged those into the proofs and the proofs stayed stable. And okay. eventually, I had all the pieces. And then I wrote some code and figured out that that laptop there could handle all of the all the necessary back office computation for my system to handle the global economy. Interesting. And now, so you come you come up with this, and you say, "Hey, my system can can completely take over the global economy, completely change the way the system's working now, eliminate these middlemen, right?" How do you go from that? And then you go to the patent office. Like you, you file. How, how did that process work? You file white papers. Do you like how does that work? So first thing, 
um, a lot of historical research mm -hmm. to figure out whether or not anybody had ever thought of this before. Right. Um, and, and also some more coding just to, you know, solidify it. Uh, I started looking around for uh, lawyers mm -hmm. to talk to uh, and got only slight amounts of joy. Uh, <laughs> I eventually ar arrived on a guy named Nathan Evans uh, mm -hmm. with Woods Rogers here. Okay. Uh, he's their IP guy, very sharp. And uh, he very generous. We had a sit-down meeting. He talked to me for about two hours, and it concluded, and he said, I think you're onto something, but I can't understand the words coming out of your, you know, calculus to people. Right. Uh, one attorney I spoke to, the, the first question about any patent, by the way, is whether or not you've published. Because right. if you tell people about it, then it's public information and you can't patent it anymore. Okay. So no to any inventors out there. Until you've patented it, you can't talk about it. Gotcha. Or, or publish. The problem existed, and that I just told him how to do it, because that's is just took this approach and solved that problem. And he said, okay, cool. You've never told anybody how to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that doesn't count. Uh-huh. Ethan agreed to help me look for an attorney. Okay. And uh, I filed a preliminary uh, patent application. And that gives you a year, basically. And uh, sort of a series of accidents and the skin of my teeth wound up with a firm out of Boston that has a strong relationship with uh, Harvard Business School. Okay. And Talked them through the system, showed them the white paper that I'd written in the interim, right. and uh, and got the initial patent filing in. And so, how long ago was that? Seven plus years at this point. Seven plus years. And then, why don't you have a patent yet? Well, uh, they accepted it, so they agreed that it, it was patentable, and then they ignored that acceptance. Uh, now there's a way to withdraw an acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't do that, um, and then they came up with this objection that it didn't involve an advance in the state of the art, uh, which is a, in algorithmic terms, this is simply a mathematical question. And I provided the mathematical proofs that it did, uh, and so they were forced to relent. And then I got another notice acceptance about two years ago. And then three weeks after that, they withdrew that notice of acceptance and came up with the novel theory that if this patent were granted, then it would get used. Um, and since that would give me too much power, the patent couldn't be granted. Uh, and, uh, and the examiner and his supervisor uh, talked to my attorney and said, we don't agree with any of this. We think it's all nonsense, but we've been told to do this by people that we're not allowed to talk to you about. Right. And who we personally can't understand. So we can't tell you what their reasons are because what they told us is nonsense. Right. So we just wrote nonsense down here. Yeah. And, uh, and so then I filed an appeal and that appeal has been scheduled for the summer of 2025. That is crazy that there is, you created a product that's never been used and they come back and tell you, one, a BS answer the first time. You appeal that. Second time, you do, uh, they come back and say, well, if we use your product, everybody's going to use it. And it's going to change the way that we do business, essentially. And so we can't do it. So, like, what, who, what I'd love to know, or who are the guys pulling the strings on that? That would be fantastic. Um, the patent office has been completely unforthcoming about that. I and bet it's the guys that are making $800 billion. It definitely might be. Uh, they also stiffed my congressional office uh, for that information and falsified the timeline. Uh, they, they left out the first one and finished out the form letter with a sharply worded note to the congressman that under patent office 
uh, policy, they would only communicate with me or my attorney on this matter through formal channels of the people that we're actually allowed to talk to, i.e. my examiner and his supervisor, right. and that they would not respond to any requests for any information from any other avenue ever again. That, that's just like, hey, we know you, you solved something. Now you got to come fight us about it, you know? And, and, and the bet, they have $800 billion in the pocket, and you don't to fight them. Right. Yes, I'd be perfectly happy to fight them on any venue that's available. But right. since they would lose, no venues are being made available. Mm. That's interesting. Um, th- it's just fascinating to me that there's people out there that have that much power that, that are controlling controlling things that are happening that, that could help people's lives, could... The farmer could make more money. The, well, you know. to put this in sort of broader context, the entire U.S. economy is somewhere between 20 and $25 trillion a year. Right. So $800 billion is somewhere between like four, three and four percent of, of that figure. So if... American Airlines runs on 3 or 4% profit margins. If half of that were to be released, right. the rate that our economy grows would increase by one and a half to two and a half points. So a 2% growth economy year, sort of a, by the numbers average, would turn into a 4% growth economy year. A banner, like, you know, wonder thing. Right. A half a percent drop a serious bad recession would turn into a one and a half percent growth. Uh, Not particularly stellar, but average year. Right. Uh, A 3% growth would turn into a 5% growth. And that would continue basically for every year of everyone's lives for a century or more. Well, how long? Okay. Two questions on that. Where does it go? Where does the, where does that money go? Does it go to the producers? That money would go initially to production, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when production becomes much more profitable, when you are deciding what your next business venture is, and you start looking around and thinking about, you know, am I going to get into a service business and try to wedge myself into this marketplace, or am I going to set up a cow farm or build a new kind of tractor? Well, there's a lot more money in in making stuff than there used to be. So... More production happens in order to create enough demand for the expanded production. Prices have to come down Mm -hmm. to stimulate interest. Uh, And so then that gets to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it becomes easier to get into the processing business. And so more people get into that. And then that comes to the consumer. So it, it starts with production because if you're not making stuff, you don't have it. Right. But it spreads out across the entire system. So, I mean, everybody here, I think, in this room would agree that that would probably be a beneficial thing to have. And everybody listening, I, I'm, I'm sure this is a beneficial thing to have, right? Um, what, and it's unfortunate that we don't have it, right? Uh, and we just got to ask ourselves, Why? That's, that's what I do all the time. I just ask myself, why, why don't we have this? I honestly think there's a cure for cancer out there. I just think it's such a profitable business that um, the, cure doesn't get, the cure doesn't get put out there. I don't know. Cancer is a very hard problem, but it definitely is the case that our existing health industry is not exploiting the technologies that we have to make us healthier. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, You say that. What, what do you mean? What technologies do we have? I mean, you're obviously more, more informed in the tech side of things, right? Well, there's a simple example I tried out all the time. Okay. We know for certain that we can build a machine that can read x-rays and other sensory, uh, medical sensory devices better than we can train human beings to read those machines. Okay. We also know for certain that we cannot use those machines to actually do that job because the way that we build those machines is not 
in a manner that would make them trustable with actual human lives. It's it's a reverse course thing. So so you're literally talking like I don't know if you saw the movie like was it what is the Shia LaBeouf Golden uh, the the movie that he has um, Golden Golden Eye Golden Eagle uh, um, which one which Eagle Eye Eagle Eye yes where where it will is that what you're talking about uh, no 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 so it's it's a lot simpler than that. Let's say you have the medical records anonymized or whatever okay. of 10,000 people's chest x-rays uh, from 20-ish years ago, and you already know what happened to all of them. Right. So you know exactly what the diagnosis is, oh. and you know exactly what the chest x-rays were. So this is going into your computational stuff. And so you, you put those into a reinforcement learning, something like how... Google's AlphaGo and mm-hmm. those types of systems work, and it pops out in a couple of hours this thing that looks at chest X-rays and tells you what's wrong with the person. Right, and it outperforms. Those systems will outperform human beings at by by degrees that are so great that no training regime that we have or could imagine having could allow you to get human beings to get that good at doing that. But that's a entirely past-based system. Mm-hmm. So if you built such a thing, we wouldn't have a validation mechanism for it. We wouldn't have a expansion mechanism for it. So as we discovered new techniques and new technologies, we wouldn't be able to integrate with it. So we could not trust that machine that some high school students with a decent-sized Amazon account could build as a summer project uh-huh. with diagnosing chest X-rays. But we could, if we decided to, solve those other sociological problems and build one of those machines that would stop misdiagnosing people's chest X-rays or be able to get even better results than we can currently get out of current chest X-rays from much lower dosage exposures mm-hmm. because these things don't need as much information to make the decisions that, that goes into another thing like Gary Brecca I, I think it's Gary Brecca um, he was on I was listening to a, a, a show or, or listening to something and, he, and he's talking about how insurance companies can basically they take all this information right and they can literally plug you in the computer and then calculate what your remaining lifespan is going to be like within a couple months, which, yeah, which yeah. is pretty wild, and that's that's kind of going along the same. Retailers hey, can do that. Are you familiar with the the famous Target story about, I, about the dad and the yes. and the the daughter that was pregnant? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So your grocery store knows more about the medical status of every member of your family than your doctor does. That's just a true fact about today. It's all data. We can't use that information in a way that makes you healthier because we haven't built civilizational forms that would allow us to do such a thing. Uh-huh. But we could, and if we decide to do so, we would become a lot healthier, a lot wealthier, a lot happier. Well, why, do you, why don't they do it? Well, it's, it's, it's why don't we do it, well, and true. we aren't. I'm yeah. working on this. Right. Maybe after we double human wealth, then we can work on, you know, doubling human health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I like the health as wealth, right? I like, to, I like to think that being healthy and being active and having the ability to do what I want, um, that's, that's the wealth aspect of it. And I really think they have this ability and the data to be able to do this kind of stuff. Like you said, I mean... They know more about my body than I know about my body just from what I purchase. I feel like, honestly feel like, I almost feel like it's, it's a money grab. Like, okay, just let him keep doing that and it's not healthy for him. It's not this. It's not that. And I know when he's going to dive. Insurance companies are going to know what to charge me per month to make their, their best investment possible, right? Unless something catastrophic happens. Um, and so it's just interesting how, like, all these data points that we and we need to come together and, and just make life better, you know, better choices. Like, why don't you tell us, hey, stop eating uh, the cheese sticks, Carson, 
if you're watching this, uh, every day, right? Stop eating the cheese sticks every day and like, let's do something different. Let's do, this is a healthier choice. Maybe that comes on the, uh, the receipt and say, hey, you know, this causes X, Y, Z. And just because we want you to be healthy, because the, if you're healthy, I have you for a customer longer, right? Well, that's, that gets down to the ethics of how to operate civilizations that have access to computers, which... And you're big on ethics. Uh, well, I think that's a critical part of and with, professional responsibility. With, uh, all right, so ethics on AI, where do you think that's going? Uh, currently nowhere. Yeah? Uh, yes. The, the public statements made by the heads of companies of the existing AI uh, groups are extremely discouraging. Um, I've I've been I've been in a number of like industry meetups where these things are described, and one of the the common themes uh, is that the experts always want open with we don't want to scare you, and my standard question is why don't you want to scare people? Right. Um, because people should be terrified. Right. Um, and not for literally any of the reasons that are public. Mm -hmm. um, people should be terrified because what we're doing right now is harming us. And what do you mean by that? Well, let's go back to the medical example. Okay. Uh, how, what does misdiagnostics cost? I saw a paper... Well, uh, the, number one, the number one thing, the number one cause of death in the medical... is, is uh, doctors mis... Miss, right. uh, what do they call it? You, you, uh, iotropic, uh, I believe. It's when either you don't know what caused it or the medical care itself caused the problem. Yeah. And so that's the number one cause in, in the medical profession with the deaths. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw a paper from a couple of months ago that suggested that uh, uh, cancer specialists getting referrals from general practitioners mm -hmm. say that 90% of the time there's a material error in the diagnosis that, that is being referred to them. Okay. Uh, now, that's not, you know, it doesn't kill the patient 90% of the time, but that's, that's a big deal. So we're actively killing hundreds of thousands of people a year, maybe, uh, by not developing these systems that, again, high school students can build. Right. If you build the ethical system around it to be able to, to utilize it. Um, and, and the financial system is, is even worse. The, yeah, I don't think ethics and finance go together. Especially when you get into Wall Street. Yes. So the EPA uses a sort of back of the envelope five million dollar human life equivalent. Okay. So if you waste five million dollars, then you're sort of administratively killing an American citizen um, because you're destroying the resources that would have enabled an American citizen to be born and raised and have a life and so on. Okay. Uh, Eight hundred billion dollars a year divided by. Five million is a hundred and sixty five thousand or a hundred and sixty thousand a year yeah uh, I'm glad you and did that math the here. number's probably closer to a trillion dollars now, which means it's about two hundred thousand a year right uh, now two hundred thousand a year is absorbable within a population of three hundred and thirty million mm -hmm. uh, but that's 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 people whose lives are essentially being stopped from existing because of the amount of waste and fraud and abuse and error and greed and whatever else you want to call it. How much waste do you think, and like, I'm only asking this question because you've gone through all this stuff, how much waste do you think has been or is throughout all markets? Like, so as I mentioned before, uh, the number of middlemen has gone up by a factor of five. Right. And markets still function more or less. It's not like there's some sort of magically better prices that are, that are functioning wildly better today than there was mm -hmm. in the 80s. So uh, that, that provides a floor for our estimate of 80%. It can't be less than 80% uh, because it used to be d being done with 20% of the current effort. Okay. Um, 
However, my algorithm is at scale roughly 300,000 times more efficient than the existing algorithm. So that would be 99.997%. Right. It's 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 amazing, and, and I, I that you took this on, that you went through it, and you thought about everything that you could do. I mean, you could probably give you any problem, and f you could figure it out mathematically, build something on it, and you know, it would it, it would change people's lives. But this changes like this changes the whole world, really. Well, that's... because we're just talking we're just talking about the United States right now. Yes. we're not talking about international uh, trade or anything like that. The United States is is roughly uh, one sixth of the global economy. So you know, multiply these numbers by six right. and spread them out over eight billion people. Right. It's huge. It's massive. Uh, yeah. Well, that's kind of what got me off my couch for this one because yeah. the the effect was big enough and the input looked like it might be small enough that I would actually have the resources to push this particular boulder up this particular hill. Why don't you think anybody else has come up with this? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of giants whose shoulders I'm standing on. Uh -huh. um, so game theory uh, basically gets invented in the early 20th century and gets most of its development in the mid-century uh, under under lock and key, basically, the U.S. decided to deploy their, it as part of their military strategy mm -hmm. and, and nuclear strategy. And so game theory doesn't become sort of a well-known and studied thing in the general swing of things until around the time I was born, actually. Okay. Uh, information theory uh, goes back to the 40s, 50s, um, and that allow, that's what allows us to know that we can always measure information in some way mm -hmm. and provides a lot of techniques to do that. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, that was done at Bell Labs. Uh, ubiquitous computers, like the, this more or less depends on the internet existing. So if somebody in 1341, you know, wakes up to a brilliant idea town criers, you don't really get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. So so there's there's not much point at that point and maybe they just go back to sleep and forget it. Yeah. So the I'm I'm bringing together some fairly disparate technologies which are between, you know, 50 and 80 years old and which most people aren't aware of and most people that are aware of any one of them aren't aware of you know, sort of like the five things that are coming together right. in in uh, in these different parts, and uh, and then your inventions are somewhat a reflection of who you are as a person, mm -hmm. and uh, the people that are in the existing financial community are very high energy, very high ambition, mm -hmm. very in it for themselves types, right, and so. They wouldn't really have the point of view of how do I create a system that works on its own, that that does something across multiple points of view. They're looking at the market and going, "How do I get a piece of it?" You're looking at the market and going, "How does how does it work better?" Right. You just they just ask a different question. Yes. Yeah. And as long as you ask the questions that people who are successful with an existing system asks, mm -hmm. you will never come up with this answer. Right. You have to ask a completely different question to get a completely different answer. Right, and i i wasn't I wasn't trying to solve this problem. Right, I was I was I was trying to do something else to validate an approach, in the hope that solving this problem would validate that approach. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh, well, actually, <laughs> this is a gold mine. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's very interesting in what you're doing and what you've done. Um, I really think that the people, like just people in general, need to support um, people doing good things like this because what I feel is what happens is that you get a group that has money and they just control what's going on. They buy people off, they make things happen, 
uh, you know, exact example of what's going on with your with your patent. You know, there's a guy there, there's a, or a group of individuals that say, "Holy cow!" Right? They they probably got in the back office at the patent office like uh, Morse code. Probably not, <laughs> but you know what I mean. There's like a, a direct line to these guys saying, "Hey, this has come up in the financial market. Um, what do you guys think about this? Should we should we approve it? Should we not approve it?" You know, it just to me, it just starts asking questions of how much do we actually know out there? Like, is, is the world what we think it is? It very much isn't, and we know that for a fact, because computers are very different things than they're generally supposed to be. Right. Uh, and yeah, uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. One of my favorite examples, uh, the hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. As any fan of Highlander knows, the hot air balloon was demonstrated in 1783. Um, but the materials required to build a hot air balloon uh, go back to between seven and 9,000 years ago. That's when uh, flax was finally developed uh, high oil content and the linseed oil would have made uh, uh, polymerizing an envelope relatively straightforward. Uh -huh. um, so the Sumerians could have developed hot air balloons before they built you know, the, the, their, their towers with the tops and the stars, mm -hmm. but nobody thought of it for eight-ish thousand years. Asking different questions. Asking different questions. The, um, well, I could sit here and talk to you for hours because I think you, you're pretty smart. You got a lot, um, a lot that you can expand on. Um, with AI, I mean, we didn't even really get into too much of that. We just talked on on the way that the the healthcare and everything. But there's just so many other ways that people can use it. Um, Noah, how how do people get a hold of you? How do they get in touch with you? Um, and you know, how do they do that? Uh, well, the most re Reliable way to get in touch with me is my email, noahphealy at yahoo.com. Okay. Uh, and I also am on LinkedIn, so Noah Healy will find me there. Right. And I have a podcast where I talk about AI and its impacts with the former CTO of Reddit, a guy named Marty Wiener, uh, and it's called The Fourth Age. Mm -hmm. We've got, I think, eight episodes out, and uh, okay. you can follow along there. Yeah, check it out, guys. Um, this is my third conversation this week with with Noah and I've just been every single time I'm just learning something so it's pretty exciting I'm glad you've been on the show I appreciate it um, again check him out let him uh, reach out to him if you have any connections I can help him within the patent office um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind right not at all <laughs> any connections with any uh, uh, anybody that's that's high in the government that maybe can pull some, some strings for you on that too but I appreciate it thank you guys if you like the show uh, like, like, share, comment. Um, if you've made it this far, at the end of the month, I'm going to do a drawing to see if you like, share, and comment on any of the videos. I uh, we're watching, right? We're making sure that we have everybody um, that we're tracking, and I'll do a one-hour consultation on business, what you're looking for, how to expand, how to market. Um, how to grow, how to put people in place to grow, anything like that. We can have a conversation on that. I appreciate you jumping on the show today. Um, Noah, again, thank you for coming in. Um, great conversation. Uh, and I hope to have more. I'm going to start listening to your podcast too because I'm learning stuff, man. I'm learning. Great. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is terrific. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And have a great day.